In lecture five, we will look at data description for two or more variables. In the previous lecture, we looked at data exploration or data description for one variable. We will now extend that to two or more variables and then proceed to hypothesis testing. Note that while most of this lecture will focus on two variables, some of the discussion may extend to more than two variables. As discussed in the previous lecture, when we looked at the analysis of one variable, for two or more variables, the type of graphical or numerical method that you use is going to depend on two things. Firstly, is the data qualitative or quantitative? And secondly, are we interested in the difference or relationship between the variables? To illustrate this, consider the two graphs shown below. On the left-hand side, we've got a clustered bar chart. And this is used to represent qualitative data, namely car type. And then we can also see the differences between the number of cars in various areas, indicated by the height or frequency. On the right hand side, we've got a scatter plot. And a scatter plot can be used to represent quantitative data, in this case, anxiety level and noise level. And for this example, we're interested in looking at the relationship between these two variables. For the current example, we can see an approximate straight line relationship between these two variables. Picture the straight line going something like that. Moreover, we can see here that as noise level increases, anxiety level also increases. So there's a positive linear relationship between those two variables. For the remainder of this lecture, we're going to consider some examples of research questions. We will then identify the associated variables and then look at some graphical and numerical methods to look at these questions. Firstly, we have this question where we're interested in the relationship between education level and preference for remote work. So this question entails two qualitative variables. Firstly, education level, which has the categories second level, third level, master's and PhD, and then preference for remote work, which is categories yes and no. A useful way to represent the data for two qualitative variables is a contingency table. This is just a tabular representation of the distribution of two, in this case, or more qualitative variables. For example, let's say you have a sample of 135 people. And for each person, you ask what is their education level and their preference for remote work. And let's say the data can be summarized in the contingency table below. So for example, 15 people have an education level of second level and their preference for remote work is no. 30 people have a master's for their education level and their preference for work, remote work is yes. So with the table, you can start doing things like this. You can get the proportion or percentage of people who have a master's and have a preference for working at home. In that case, it's just this relative fraction of 30 over 135. You can also do things like, for example, let's say you want to know of the people who have an education level of a master's, what percentage say want to work from home. So the total number of people that have a master's is 40. And the number of people who want to work home or have a preference for working remotely is 30. So we can get 30 over 40, which is 75%. So 75% who work from home or who have a master's have a preference for working from home. So it's a nice way of getting all the data in one place and calculating these percentages or fractions. In terms of analysis of qualitative variables, there are many different types of graphs. So I'm just going to look at two specific examples here. Firstly, in the graph on the left hand side, we have a clustered bar chart. And in this bar chart, we're representing the information from the previous slide, that of education level, and preference for working remote. In this example, I've categorized by education level, so second level, third level, etc. And then the colors are used to represent the preference. So we can see here 
as a person's education level increases, say from second level up to PhD, they tend to prefer to work remote, indicated by the higher green bars. In the second graph on the right, we have a stacked bar chart where the bars are stacked one above the other. In this example, I've categorized by preference for remote work. On the left, we have no, on the right, yes. And then the color is color coding is used to represent the various education levels. So this is a nice way to compare, say, the people who prefer to work no or prefer not to work remote with the people who do prefer to work remote by education level. Now, typically with qualitative data, we're usually not interested in measuring the differences between variables. It's uncommon because you can't really measure the difference numerically, at least, between qualitative variables. But we can look at the relationships or patterns between the qualitative variables. Next, we will consider the relationship between two quantitative or numerical variables. The second research question is the following. Is there a relationship between the number of part-time working hours per week of a student and their final grade? Now, there are two quantitative variables here, the number of part-time hours per week and final grade. And we can also distinguish those two types of variables. The first one, the number of hours, think of that as the independent variable or the explanatory variable. It's going to explain changes in the other variable. Final grade then can be thought of as the dependent variable or response variable. It responds to changes in the other variable. So in this example, we would expect that the more hours a student spends on part-time work, their final grade should decrease. But we will see that in a moment if that's true or not. We've represented the data below in a small uh, contingency table or frequency table, and we can represent that graphically or look at this numerically. For this example, we have eight data points representing, say, eight students, where, say, student one worked 20 hours part-time per week, and they ended up getting a final grade of 46%. The eighth student worked 25 hours part-time per week and got a final grade of 31. In relation to graphical methods for quantitative variables, one of the most important tools that you can use is what's called a scatter plot. A scatter plot describes the relationship between two quantitative variables, and it gives you a very, very quick snapshot of if there's a relationship or not between the data. For example, for the data we had on the previous slide, we can represent those eight students on the scatter plot shown. So on the horizontal axis, we have number of hours spent working. That's our independent variable, our explanatory variable. And on the vertical axis, we have the response variable or the dependent variable. And you can see here that the information from the table is great, but looking at the graph, you can get some information very quickly about whether or not there's a relationship between these two variables. And we can see that there appears to be a relatively strong negative linear relationship between those two variables. It's negative because as the number of hours spent working increases, you can see that the final de final grade decreases. So this student, for example, who has who spends a large number of hours working, they have a low grade. If we compare that to this student here, who spends only a few hours working, they get a, a high grade. It's linear because we can fit an approximate straight line to the data, so something like this. I'm going to talk a bit more that, of that in the subsequent slides, and it's a strong relationship. The definition of strong will become more clear in a moment. We look at some more examples where we have strong, weak, and moderate relationships. Here are some more examples of scatter plots, and we're looking at the relationship between x, the independent variable, and y, the response variable. If we take the top three graphs first, in each of these, we can see that there's a positive relationship. As x increases, y increases. But as we move from left to right, the strength of the relationship increases. You can see here in, say, graph C, there is a perfect positive correlation or strong or perfect positive relationship between x and y. And draw a straight line. 
and the points will sit perfectly on that line. Moving back to B, there's a, also a positive, relation, a positive relationship or positive correlation, but we could say that this one, it's not perfect, but it's strong. A straight line will still go reasonably well through the points, but the points won't sit perfectly on the line. They'll be scattered either side of it. And moving back to A, again, there's a positive correlation between X and Y, but it's not that strong anymore. You can picture a straight line going through something like that. And the points, they're a bit more scattered either side of it. It's a similar situation with D to F, only that this time we're dealing with negative correlations. As X increases, Y decreases. And approximate straight lines will go in D and E, and a perfect straight line will go through F. Now, these first six examples all fit in with linear relationships, straight lines, but just there's lots of other types of examples that you can see. For example, if we look at H below, so if we look at that, a straight line relationship doesn't work here. Imagine you draw this straight line. It doesn't explain the data over on the right. Okay, but that doesn't mean there's a relation, there is not a relationship between the data. In this case, there's a nonlinear relationship, or to be more specific, we could fit a quadratic curve to that data, something like that. Okay, so just because there isn't a linear relationship between the data, it does it still means there could be a relationship, in this case, a nonlinear. And of course, you will also encounter data where there will be no correlation or no relationship, as in the case of G. You can't fit any straight line or curve to that. The data is just randomly scattered around. There's no relationship between the variables. So with these scatter plots, to determine if there's a linear relationship or some type of relationship or not, we just look at the graph. But there's a more quantitative approach to actually measure the strength of that relationship. And to measure the strength of a linear relationship, we have what's called the linear correlation coefficient, or it's just to know it R. And that measures the strength and direction of the linear relationship between your two continuous variables. The graph below explains the various values that R can take on. So its range is from minus one all the way up to plus one. It does not, it's not smaller than minus one, not bigger. It has to be between those values. And if we take zero in the middle, if you have a correlation coefficient of zero, that means there is no relationship between your data and you get a graph like this. Now, as you say move from zero to plus one, you're moving into the positive relationship area. And the closer you get to plus one, the more perfect your relationship is. So at plus one, we have a straight line that would perfectly go through the points. Point five, we have still a positive linear relationship, but the line is not going to sit on the points perfectly. They'll be scattered either side. And it's a similar situation as you move back from zero to minus one, moving into the negative correlations or negative linear relationships. Again, I'll emphasize that this correlation coefficient only works for checking if your data is linear related or not. And there is a formula for calculating this, but I'm not going to present that here. There's a bit of work in calculating it, but if you're using something like R or Excel, it's just a function that can be used to calculate R. On the previous slides, I have drawn in a straight line on some of the scatter plots to indicate how a linear relationship fits the data, but there is a more uh, quantitative approach to do that. And that's where simple linear regression comes in. So the straight lines that I was drawing just by hand, they can be calculated such that you get a graph like we have down here. Again, I'm not going to go into too much on the detail on how that straight line is calculated. In R or Excel, it is able to draw that line for you. And it's going back to what you would have seen with coordinate geometry. You have a straight line of this form, y equals mx plus c. Now in statistics, it's given different notation, but it's essentially that. So you can fit that straight line to the data. Now the whole reason you do this is then that you have a model. This is your model. For this example, given a value of x, so that's your independent variable, which is number of hours working, you can calculate the corresponding 
dependent variable, which is final grade. So a student could come along to you and say they're going to work this number of hours part time during uh, the year. You will be able to give them an approximate value for their final grade based on the model that you've calculated using this sample of eight data. So scatter plots are ideal for looking at the relationship between two quantitative variables. But if we want to look at the difference between two, two quantitative variables, we can use other types of graphs and analysis. For this third research question, we're interested in the, seeing if there's a significant difference in the mean exam scores between students taught with method A and students taught with method B. So there are two quantitative variables here. The exam score of a student taught with method A and the exam score of a student taught with method B. So we have two groups of students with their scores using method A and method B, and we can represent that information graphically with say histograms on the left and box plots on the right. So in the previous lecture, we saw both these types of graphs, but in that context, it was for one quantitative variable, but they can be used for two or more quantitative variables as also. So with the histograms on the left, we can do things like see if the data is skewed or symmetric. And the box plots on the right can be used for various things such as identifying outliers. And we can also compare various measures shown on the box plot to see if the two methods are different or not. And that's what we'll look at over the next few slides. So box plots are really good for visualizing the difference between quantitative variables. For example, below I've got three quantitative variables, the number of gears in cars. So three, four, or five, and we're interested in the miles per gallon associated with cars and these number of gears. So the first thing we can look at is central tendency. So if we compare the medians of these individual box plots, so the medians are the middle line in the box plots indicated here. So a higher median will suggest a higher central tendency, while a lower median indicates a lower central tendency. So for the example below, we might look at it and say that, well, the car with the cars with four gears as opposed to three gears, because their median is higher, on average, they will have a higher miles per gallon. Another way to check. Another way to check this is to see if the boxes of the box plots overlap or if they are separated. For example, below, we can see here that there is no overlap between cars with three and four gears, whereas there is overlap between cars with four and five gears. So in the case of four and five gears, because they have overlapping boxes, that might may indicate similar central tendencies, while in the case of three and four gears, because there is no overlap or there's separation, that might suggest that there's a difference between the two in terms of miles per gallon. In terms of variability, what we can do with the box plots is compare the interquartile range. You should recall from the previous lecture that the interquartile range is the difference between the third quartile and the first quartile, or the length of that box shown. So by comparing various box plots and their boxes, the length of them, we can see which has more variability. For example, if we compare this box here, its interquartile range with the one beside it, we can see that it is more spread out because its interquartile range is larger. We can also look at the difference or distance between the whiskers as a measure of variability. And what are other good thing about box plots, and this is something we mentioned previously, is that box plots can be used to identify outliers. So extreme values, extreme small or large values that don't follow the distribution of your data. So in this case here, we have one very large value compared to the majority of our data. For quantity, all the quantitative measures that we mentioned previously for a single variable, applied to two quantitative variables also. So measures of centrality, such as the mode, the mean, the median, and measures of variation, such as the range, standard deviation, interquartile range, also apply for two or more variables. We can also use skewness to compare symmetry or asymmetry in the data distribution. So you'll recall, if we have a symmetric data set, 
you could have something like this, whereas skewed, left skewed or right skewed are like this. And we have a quantitative measure that can, it can be used, and that's this value of skewness. There are other formulas used for this as well, but typically, if your skew, skewness value is close to zero, you have a symmetric data set, whereas if it's less than zero or greater than zero, it's skewed, left skewed and right skewed respectively. Now, the way you decide if it's skewed or not, that depends on the context. For example, when I'm teaching this in class, for students, I say if it's less than minus one, we say it's negatively skewed. Whereas if it's squared and plus one, it's positively skewed. Anything in between, we can say it's approximately symmetric. But those values of minus one and plus one, they can vary depending on the context you're looking at. So that concludes the different types of analysis. In the next recording, we'll start looking at hypothesis testing.